Hello and welcome to a brand new set of bad adaptations. I want you to watch me. I need you to read me. Today we will be talking about the play Taming of the Shrew and the movie Ten Things I Hate About You, which rhymes. I guess we'll get started with uh, some quick summaries. So the play The Taming of the Shrew was written sometime around 1592 or earlier, at least according to Stephen Greenplatt and his gang of scholars. And it's a play within a play that begins with the character Christopher Sly, who's tricked into thinking that he's royalty, and he watches a play about two sisters, Bianca and Kate, who are in this world of courtship. Kate is the titular shrew, and Bianca is the woman that the suitors all want and need to get past Kate in order to secure Bianca's hand in marriage. The plot involves hiring this man to tame Kate, uh, Catherine, who he calls Kate. Kate, for that's your name, I hear? Well, have you heard? That's something hard of hearing. They call me Catherine that do talk of me. You lie in faith for your cold plain Kate. Uh, and in the end, through some very problematic means, which we will discuss, he does tame her. And we see that Bianca is able to be secured by her suitors who all don disguises to also try to court her. And the end is Bianca flipping the tables and becoming the shrew and Kate trained to be exactly who Petruchio wants her to be. And so the film 10 Things I Hate About You was released in 1999 and it stars Julia Stiles as Cat, so no E, at Stratford, which is a play on Stratford upon Avon where Shakespeare was born. Mm -hmm. And then we have Heath Ledger as Patrick Verona, Verona being where Petruchio is from in the play. Um, of course, Patrick is their version of Petruchio. Names are really tricky in the play, yeah. hence me not naming like anybody <laughs> except Catherine and Bianca. Right. <laughs> so none of those names really transferred through. <laughs> yeah, so we've got Patrick, we've got Kat, we have Bianca, which stayed the same. I guess mm -hmm. that name hasn't really no, I... fallen out as much as uh, Petruchio. <laughs> Anybody that wants to name their kid that, you know, have that, that's a gift to you yeah. from us. <laughs> Um, Bianca is the younger sister, and she wants to be the popular one. Um, Kat is like a, you know, a raging feminist who hates all men. And Patrick has come back from a year of not being at uh, Padua High, which is <laughs> Padua is where the, the play within the play takes place. And then we have Cameron, who falls in love. He's just arrived at Padua. Um, and he instantly falls in love with Bianca. But Bianca is kind of interested in Joey. So the play um, turns into this modernized, simplified rom-com. Um, and all the guys get the girls, and the bad guys get their comeuppance. Like, it's very obvious who's a bad guy and who's a good guy right. in the movie, and in, in the play, it's really not the case. Um, I guess we can begin by one of the probably largest themes, which is the idea of um, disguise and deception. The play can only take place through deception, mm -hmm. which is also in the movie, but in a really different way, right? Right, so the play begins with this outer frame of this drunkard having, so a peasant having fallen asleep, Christopher Sly, and the Lord comes back and he decides to play a joke on him and is going to pretend that Christopher Sly is the real Lord and he's just been dreaming. This theme of madness is really fascinating yeah. with disguise because it's not just disguise like, say, Twelfth Night where people are putting on clothes, right. but it's actually disguise as in you are mad and this is why this disguise that you have is actually your reality. Yeah. So like Christopher Sly is told that he's been mad for 15 years mm -hmm. and then in the, the play within the play, uh, Kat is told that she is mad and then mm -hmm. um, Petruchio's kind of exterior awfulness to her is played up as him being mad. So mm -hmm. it's madness that helps disguise. Mm -hmm. In the movie, I don't think we really get a lot of um, disguise in the same way as in the play. Yeah. But we do have, so Michael woos Mandela to the prom mm -hmm. um, by sending her a letter supposedly from your love, W. Shakespeare. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
And he gives her like a pseudo Shakespearean era type dress mm -hmm. to wear to prom and he's in like a red... Austin Powers suit. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's not historically accurate. <laughs> but well played. And other disguises... Oh yeah, we were talking about earlier how Patrick... I don't know if he contributes to the rumors, but definitely people have ideas about him being a really dangerous bad boy, that yeah. he eats ducks and he doesn't have his liver anymore. Porn career. And he doesn't correct any of those rumors, so he plays into it, which is kind of a disguise. Yes, I, I, I feel like because yeah. it's in a high school, disguise is such a different it's a different beast in high school. So like in the play, these are dealing with like social status. Mm -hmm. There's one point yeah. where um, clothes are exchanged in order for one of Bianca's suitors, Lucentio, to mm -hmm. become her tutor. He has to take on his servant's clothes. Mm -hmm. um, and clothes are what rank, distinguish you by rank. In high school, it's rumors. And it's like the rumor mill. And it's the way that rumors attribute your personality to you. Right. So like you have these established, like Kate is, you know, the quote unquote bitch and Patrick is the bad boy, and Bianca is the sweet, innocent girl who's popular, and Joey is the hand model, or nose model, or... Underwear <laughs> model? Underwear model. Well, I've got the Sears catalog thing going, and, uh, and the tube sock gig. That is gonna be huge. Ah! Oh. Oh and I'm up for hemorrhoid cream ad next week. Um, so, like, rumors are kind of the things that disguise and cloak you, and whether you go against those rumors or follow them is what determines what your disguise is. Right. So it's almost like Kate, a lap, or, ah, cat. 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 Told you we'd have a cat in every video. <laughs> when she kind of, we learn later why she's no longer popular, she was popular, she allows the rumors to fall on her and builds that persona and that wall so that she has a, that's a disguise. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, sort of what lends itself to the ending where Patrick ends up being like not such a bad boy and Kat ends up not being such a shrew but it's not her having been tamed it's like actually just her shucking off her disguise so that is entirely different because there's no taming and so when we say taming in the play it is quite literally like there's this entire linguistic uh, carry through in the play itself about taming animals and so Kate mm. It, Kate in the play, not Kat. So yeah. um, it's important to note that when Petruchio first meets Catherine, she's called Catherine by everybody else in the play. Mm -hmm. When he first meets her, he calls her Kate. Yeah. And that's the first signal that he is tearing off her identity and quite literally taming her. Mm -hmm. um, it's giving somebody a different name. She, she's no longer Catherine. Right. You have a lot of wordplay, and he also calls her Wild Kate, which the Folger <laughs> edition helpfully mentions is obviously a pun on Wildcat. So yeah, he, there's definitely this, she's an animal, he's taming her to be a proper quote-unquote woman. Mm -hmm. I guess we can just get into the gender dynamics and why this play brings up a lot of contention in the way that people approach it, read it, and even stage it. A lot of people when they stage it have thought of creative ways to kind of tone down the, the really awfulness that happens to Catherine in mm -hmm. the play by putting a lot of facial expressions on the actor who plays her. All of the taming actually ends up failing by adding these extra kind of body cues. Mm -hmm. But in the play itself, uh, it's, it's a combination of gaslighting and Stockholming. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular woman, Catherine, in order to make her less shrewish. Another adaptation I've seen of Taming of the Shrew was actually at the Globe Theatre. So I was in London last year and they had this fantastic adaptation where they set the whole play in the Easter Rising in Ireland. So Kate is a bonny Irish lass. And by the end, she ends up being tame. So, I mean, it's a lot more truthful to the play. Yeah. But because they set it in Ireland, the allegory is she represents Ireland and Petruchio represents England. That, that taming is colonialization. So, on to our adaptation for today. <laughs> in the movie, I appreciate some of the ways that they tried to update it. In faith, I do not love thee with mine eyes, for then thee a thousand errors note. But tis my heart that loves what they despise, who in despite of you is pleased to dope. It's not as hard to watch in a way. Yeah. I think there's commentary that you could say Shakespeare is doing with the play. But with the movie, again, he doesn't really tame her. In fact, 
Patrick actually kind of, or his disguise, gets tamed. Almost him becoming his truer self. Mm -hmm. So taking off the disguises, taking away the cigarette that would sort of add to a bad boy persona. And by the time that they're kind of actually getting to know each other, they're like on a paddle boat, mm -hmm. he seems much nicer and even his clothing seems to be lighter colors, yeah. I think. And that literally exposes herself for yes. him by like flashing <laughs> the... So she's literally like showing her body and putting herself out there for him. Yeah. And in in true spirit of a teen movie, that is such a risky move. Yeah. And it backfires on both of them. And so they, they, they have that breakup moment right. where Kat um, actually recognizes that this was a bet, she gets mad at him, Patrick also, <laughs> why does everything rhyme? I feel like I'm in Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Patrick um, kind of gets mad at her, um, they, they split up and we find out Patrick smokes still, mm -hmm. um, so the disguises are again used as ways to content maintain distance without mm -hmm. having to admit one's insecurities and reality. Now we'll move on to Bianca. Mm -hmm. So Bianca, she's still sort of the more um, amiable of the two, but in the play we have more suitors mm -hmm. going for Bianca. It's three, right? Right, yeah. so we have Lucentio, Gremio, and Hortensio, I yes. believe. Yes. Gremio is outmatched pretty early on, and then it's down to Hortensio and Lucentio as... What is he named? Zambio! Bianca in both the film and the play is deeply underestimated. She has her own disguise, but the disguise itself comes from the way that the men around her view her. So she's viewed as beautiful and virginal, and there's one like line in the movie about wearing a strategically planned sundress. She's, she's an actual created image, and what's so fantastic is at the end, she takes what she actually is and comes out, and she's much more like Catherine at the beginning of the play, mm -hmm. Catherine who binds her sister's hands mm -hmm. and beats somebody with a lute and slaps people. Um, and that is that is the true Bianca. And we get that in the film in the most kick-ass yeah. scene ever. Oh. Oh. That's for making my day bleed. That's for my sister. Oh. And that's for me. It does seem that Bianca, though, in the movie is actually demure and wants Joey and wants to be popular, wants everyone to like her, as she says to Kat. But then she has this real transformation in the movie yeah. where at the prom, after Joey has revealed in front of Kat that Patrick was being paid and it was all set up, she, well, first Cameron is like trying to defend her honor mm -hmm. and fails. <laughs> and then Bianca shows up and punches Joey. It's yeah. so great. But yeah, that is one of the best moments of the film. And I think actually the actress who ended up playing Bianca originally auditioned for Cat. Oh. Yeah. Um, a different movie. Very different movie. How is it possible that I did not know about this? There's this contest amongst the men now settled with their women. So we have Hortensio with his widow and Lucentio, Lucentio with Bianca and then Patricio with Catherine. Mm -hmm. And each man kind of bets if their wife will come to them. And so Bianca and the widow both refuse to come. Hey, I will not! Ow! And then Patricio is like, oh, I can, I can get Kate to do this. And he gets Kate to come, not only bring the other women with her, but also, you know, go after them about what it is to be wifely. Thy husband is thy lord, thy life, thy keeper, thy head, thy sovereign, one that cares for thee. And for thy maintenance commits his body to painful labor, both by sea and land, to watch the night in storms, the day in cold, while thou liest warm at home, secure and safe. The ending monologue that Kate gives is this, I don't know, it's just the like virtues of being a good, patient wife, being passive, and that's the best thing you can do is to love your husband and serve him. Which is, like, reading the play, that's why you need to really see it stage. Reading it, it seems, I was just like, oh god, no. But in the film, entirely different, where she has been assigned <laughs> in English class to write a Shakespearean sonnet. 
I hate your big dumb combat boots and the way you read my mind. I hate you so much it makes me sick. It even makes me rhyme. I hate it when you're not around and the fact that you didn't call. But mostly I hate the way I don't hate you. Not even close. Not even a little bit. Not even at all. This monologue at the end of the movie is just a culmination of like, oh, she really loves him, and despite all the shitty things, because he hasn't really apologized yet at this point. No. He doesn't it, actually really apologize ever. He no. just gives her a guitar. Maybe they cut these scenes out, but there's no reconciliation. She runs away from him at the prom, and then because she finds out that he actually did have a bet, he gaslights her too, just like Petrocchio. Yeah, Petrocchio. That's in, true. In the in the in the play film, Patrick actually gets Cat to start thinking that she's crazy. He actually even says, "quote You need therapy." When yeah. she rightly accuses him of being a little too much, having too much motivation to take her to the prom. But in a way that actually makes the film, I feel a little not more dangerous, but dangerous in a different way yeah. because. It is more of a happy ending, and she seems to be more of a like fully realized self, but you still have that gaslighting. And at the very end, when he meets her outside at her car, he's bought her a guitar, stuck it in her car. Did she leave the window down in her car? Why? Even then, he broke in. He broke in and <laughs> stuck it in the front seat. And then, and then she says, You can't just buy me a guitar every time you screw up, you know. Yeah, I know. But then you know there's always drums and bass and maybe even one day a tambourine. It's supposed to be like a cute way for them to maintain their like kind of cynical behaviors. In comparison to the play, that kind of is a little bit of a holdover of him having that power over her. Yeah, that is true. Because I mean, it's unrealistic. You're not really going to make a teen comedy where the boyfriend kidnaps, starves, and then somehow does some weird psychological torture to the woman. Like, that's not that's not going to happen in a It's going to be a different movie. <laughs> it would be terrible. That's like Saw-level <laughs> awfulness. But that does happen in, in yeah. the book. But yeah, it is it is true. It does set up some kind of problematic relationship expectations for teens. Yeah. We can take solace in the fact, though, that Kat has been accepted to Sarah Lawrence. Yes. She's 18 years old. Mm -hmm. She's in Seattle. Sarah Lawrence is on the other side of the country. Uh -huh. She's going to break up with Patrick's ass as soon as she sets foot on Sarah Lawrence and realizes, like, there is this entire world outside of high school. A whole new world. A new fantastic point of view. And we don't, well, we don't really know what happens to Bianca other than that she ends up going sailing with Cameron. I'm a little bit creeped out by the Cameron character, to be honest. He pretends to know French, which is supposed to be cute, but I'm like, she's better at French than he is. Like, she's not getting anything out of this relationship. No. And then he really plays the nice guy. He gives this, you know, the nice guy TM speech, like, I really liked you, and like, I would have done anything for you. And of course, what she does is she goes and kisses him, and it all plays into his favor. I'm like, don't perpetuate that stereotype where like you can just do the littlest things like send some flowers and some chocolates to a girl and suddenly she'll be transformed and love you. Yeah, it's it's very much like the first time he sees her, he's sexually objectifying her. So he's never talked to her, he knows nothing about her. That becomes this like thing where they just project whatever male fantasy they have on her. Right. They, they don't ever have to talk to her. Nobody actually who has conversations with her in that movie? Cat. And even her best friend, Chastity, played by Gabrielle Union, <laughs> um, is a shitty friend. Um, uh, I have to be home in 20 minutes. You know, I don't have to be home till 2, so... Not good at all. The father just wants to keep her like a little kid. Yeah, there's some really gross, yeah. overly paternalistic... Don't have sex, because you will get pregnant and die. Feminists watching this want to root for Kat and her feminism and pushing for this interesting agenda about gender and yet it's white feminism right. to the core and so the teacher calls her out on that. And Kat, I want to thank you for your point of view. I know how difficult it must be for you to overcome all those years of upper middle class suburban oppression. It's a good self critique in the film. But the next time you storm the PTA, crusading for better lunch meat or whatever it is you white girls complain about, ask them why they can't buy a book written by a black man. That's, That's right, right mom. mom! Don't even get me started on you two. Nope, no Despite the fact that this is a very loose adaptation, I'm gonna go ahead and say this is a good adaptation, 
good adaptation because it does make it more relevant for a younger generation that may not necessarily like Shakespeare or don't know that they like Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. They borrow some word for word from the actual right. play. Right? I burn, I pine, I perish. Of course you do. I think it's a good way to bring people to Shakespeare because Shakespeare can be really difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, I totally wholeheartedly agree. I am not a teen movie fan, I'm not a 90s movie fan, and I am definitely not a rom-com fan. Um, I like screwballs from way early on, and that's kind of where rom-coms start, but very different premises, and so I tend to watch anything from the 90s way more critical than I would watch anything else. And so I went into this thinking that I would really dislike the film, mm -hmm. um, but it's actually a really fascinating adaptation, and I, I would call it a good adaptation, a good adaptation, um, because like Amy said, it takes what is a classic play that is considered high culture and distills it into something that's digestible for teens. So it's fascinating to have something like Shakespeare used as a vehicle to talk about things like peer pressure and having sex and boyfriends and what it means to want to be a young woman and go to college or get interested in feminism. Excuse me, have you seen the feminine mystique? And I hope that all of the teens that watched this in the 90s uh, got really interested in Shakespeare and went out and took their college classes yeah. or just read um, a Shakespeare or edition. Or Raincoats or yeah, King Kill. Yeah, right, all of this, this great kind of culture. Yeah, I mean, who would think like Raincoats, Bikini Kill, and Shakespeare would like make it into the same yeah. sentence. The Ten Things I Hate About You is a really good example. It's not the best film. Mm -hmm. It's not something that is, you know, going to stand up to Hitchcock or something like that. But at the same time, it is the perfect example of why Shakespeare still resonates. His plots, like Amy said, are amazing and are perfect vehicles for transforming anything that you want to talk about into contemporary mm -hmm. um, kind of modes of discussion. In a way, I really appreciate that it's not like a Hitchcock because yeah. I think you get a lot of Shakespeare adaptations that really st try to stay true to the fact that Shakespeare is a canonical author or Kenneth that is... Branagh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, because I really love that they made it into a popular genre. Back then, Shakespeare plays were something you would go to. I mean, that's why they have the whole, like, um, I don't know how much it would have cost, but you have the standing room only, so people who couldn't afford to sit in the seats could just go stand and watch the play. So it was for everyone, and I think that's what more, like, high school movies and, like, popular rom-com chick flick type movies are like that's our modern equivalent of that so good adaptation all around so as always uh please give our video a like um subscribe to our channel share it with your friends since uh we are without cats right now we'll intersperse some images of truman with his shrew thanks for watching see you next time I want you, want me. I need